That brings us to our superintendent's report, item number 11. Dr. Hefner, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, of course, there are many, many good things going on in the district, as always. And uh, one thing that uh, is very recent, uh, which you'll be uh, recognizing at your next meeting, is I'm very happy to report that our uh, Spring Hill High School Career Pathways program has been named a Magnet School of Distinction by the Magnet Schools of America and will be honored at their national conference next month. So a very high honor uh, for Spring Hill and again a tribute to our entire district. And this evening we have uh, three quick reports that we wish to give you and I'm going to ask Dr. Melton, our Chief Instruction Officer, to do the introductions on the first two. Dr. Melton. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Hefner, Chairman Gant, board members. Tonight I have the opportunity to introduce you to our Director of Magnet Programs. As you know, Magnets and Choice have grown in School District 5 throughout the last several years. So Mrs. Wheeler, our Director of Magnet Programs, is going to come forward and give us an overview report this evening for your information. Mrs. Wheeler. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Superintendent, board members, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to give you an update on our choice and magnet programs in District 5. In an excerpt from Dr. Hefner's Vision 2015 and then reiterated again in 2020, he wanted to expand magnet and choice options throughout the district make optimum use of existing space, enhance the ability of each school to compete effectively with other schools in our district and in the community, and to meet the rigorous, unique educational needs of our students. So with that, what is the purpose of magnet schools and choice? It gives options to our community, and that's what we want to be able to do to parents and families. It keeps all of our schools viable. Sometimes with shifting demographics and with people moving, some of our schools may gain or lose students. So this is an opportunity to give choice to the community to keep all schools viable. It allows students to explore their interest. So while they're learning our state standards, they also might do it through a vehicle of a theme that they're interested in. And it aligns with the educational landscape. And I think if anyone is keeping up with the trend of the country, choice is here to stay, or at least for the next four years, or maybe more. But choice has been growing over the last several years. And in today's landscape, choice will increase. There's different types of school choice. Schools open to choice. That means schools that have available space, and those can change from year to year. So a school that might be open to choice one year may not the following year because the capacity of the zoned area is full. Magnet schools. Those, there are different types of magnet schools. You have a whole school model, and I put my little WS, so you would know it was whole school when I refer to it with our existing magnet schools later. Criteria-based model, schools within a school, and I'm gonna go back for just a minute. So a whole school model is where all schools at the magnet school, all students participate in that theme. It is what is the, the school is about, the curriculum comes through that way equitably for all kids. Criteria-based models are ones that might have a criteria to get into them, be it a portfolio, test scores, and such as that. And then you have schools within a school, which is a program that is a particular theme in a traditional school, but it has just a pathway of a program within that school. Choice and magnet awareness. Over the last 
five years, we've had, well, actually four years, but we've been developing magnets in District 5 for several years. But we have two magnet fairs we hold each year, one in the fall, one when we first come back um, after the holiday break. We have a choice page now on our District 5 website. You can go there and you can click on it and get uh, frequently asked questions. You can click on each one of our magnet schools and get a video and learn all about the theme. We have open houses at each of our schools where parents can go and visit the school and see the theme of the magnet showcase there. We have community events where we're visible. My favorite is the Okra Strut, where we are each year. But there's different community events throughout uh, District 5, and different schools participate by having booths or visiting or uh, just making themselves available to answer any questions. And then we've had lots of media coverage. The uh, television, radio, newspaper, they've all covered us, given us great stories and lots of visibility throughout all of Columbia. Interest in choice and magnets. It's become part of the culture. As I said, there had been some initial programs in the district, but four years ago we had um, an initiative where we created five new programs. And at that point it was a little bit new and becoming accustomed to it, lots of questions. But now it's become part of the culture of District 5 to expect, expect magnet choice. The interest has become year round. Even though we focus in the fall, we have an application season, now we get questions year round wanting to know I'm moving into this area. Or tell me all about your choice programs, your magnet programs. Um, building a house, I don't know where I want to live. Can you tell me what you offer? So it's become definitely part of who we are. Participation in the choice process is flourishing. Our number of applicants have grown each year that we've had the um, application season open. Every school open for choice has had applicants from outside their zone. So there is interest in choice throughout our community. Our current magnet programs, Dutch Fork Elementary Academy of Environmental Sciences, and if you've had the opportunity to ride by, look at how it's even changed its appearance outside with some of the pictures of students. And as you go through, the minute you walk in, you know you're in an environmental science venue. And that's what you're supposed to feel throughout the entire school. Seven Oaks Elementary Media Magnet, again, the same kind of feel. They have studios that rival some of the studios here. I think people in the uh, uh, media world say they can't believe. We had Asia Wilson present um, awards last year at Seven Oaks Film Festival. And she said when she was at the University of South Carolina, she didn't have the kind of equipment that these students are having the ability to learn from. Irmo Middle School International Academic Magnet. It has a wonderful international flair to it. It focuses on arts, dance, um, uh, science pro uh, projects, but more of a STEM focus as well. So they do wonderful things there. Irmo High School International School for the Arts. They also have the IB Diploma Program, which is an example of a school within a school or a program within a school. Spring Hill High School Career Pathways Magnet, and it's all magnet, meaning there is not a zone, so they take students from across the entire district, and they take 300 a year to fill their freshman class, and then they move forward from there. Dutch Fork High School STEM Program, that is a school within a school at Dutch Fork High School, and it does have a criteria uh, to get into that program. And Escalaris Academy at Harbison West is, again, a school within a school with criteria to get into the, to its track. And H.E. Corley, Leader in Me, that also is one of our magnets. And LEAP at Lee, uh, Lee Part Elementary Engineering Magnet. So those are the existing programs that we offer now through our magnet. And again, we have schools that are open to choice based on availability. And 
Remember District 5, where every choice is a great choice. Mrs. Wheeler for giving us that overview. We were trying to make sure we contain Mrs. Wheeler. She could talk with you all <laughs> evening about just this. She's a little bit passionate, as are we. I am. And I have to say, although she was our spokesperson this evening, I'll be negligent if I were not to share with you all, this has been a whole district initiative. So I have to say thanks to Public Information for helping us get marketing out. Thanks to HR for making sure that our schools are properly staffed. Of course, thanks to finance, because without funds, how can we be operational? And then, of course, thanks to Dr. Harrison Student Services because we do work uh, individually with families as well as scheduled events of the season, as Mrs. Wheeler shared with everyone. So uh, thank you, Ms. Wheeler, for this presentation. Dr. Hefner, would you like to ask any, op offer the opportunity for questions, or would you? Uh, uh, it's fine, fine with me. Ms. Wheeler, will you take questions? Uh, it's fine with me if I can <laughs> answer them. <laughs> you want to have Ms. Bumgardner? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Wheeler, for your thank presentation. You. Thank you. And I know that we have some um, magnets coming up. Um, Montessori, we approved for uh, H.E. Corley. Is that, that's, that's, and it's it not, there was a, oh, the, oh, yeah, the Fine Arts for Nursery Road. Those right. are ones that are coming. Though, right, and like you said, I believe you've seen those and approved yeah. them. And we're hoping that we're fortunate enough to get another round of the Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant, which is how we were able to put in five <coughs> programs in 2013. So that's what we're hoping will happen. But it is Montessori. It's arts at Nursery Road. It's, it's sort of tweaking STEM at Leapheart to a STEAM model by including mm -hmm. the arts. And then it's a wonderful program that will augment the International Baccalaureate program because it adds a career pathways, which is new within the last several years. So it would be a collaboration between the IB program and the center to offer a very rigorous pathway for careers. But Ms. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. For the details of that, we did do a submission of the federal grant of which mm -hmm. you all approved. And unfortunately, we were not funded in the first cycle. However, we are preparing a resubmission that we do this spring. So I actually have the application for proofing on my desk of about 120 pages yes. of technical reading. <laughs> so we're trying to make sure that that application is prepared and ready for resubmission with hopes that funding will be granted to us in October of 2017. But of course, all that is, uh, is dependent on the federal budget and the timeline of which we have dates, but it's up to those at the federal level to make sure the dates are kept in order. Okay. okay. Ms. Hammond. Um, it was a great presentation, oh, and you. I just want to say I, I have, uh, this is a good place to tell you, I think you've done a really good job also of advertising it across the, the whole district, um, because I, one of the things I've judged it by is the number of people that are aware that you know, they'll come to these meetings, but they're aware of the different opportunities. And so I think we've really done a good job of that. Oh, Y'all have. Okay. So I thank you. Um, I, I had a couple of general questions, maybe like for parents that don't know. Okay. Um, if they're considering that and they're on the other side of the district in miles, if you do choose, um, then the parent is responsible for the transportation to that school. Am I correct? Except for Spring Hill. We do provide transportation to Spring Hill from our high schools. Okay. And then um, an, another just, if you, let's say a, a, a student and parents make the decision and really think the media arts is what they want or one of them, mm -hmm. if they choose to go there, are they in that track once they get into it? Do, do, you can't move around? They can move around. In fact, Dr. Harris brought a policy, um, a, my time gets away from me, Dr. Harris, a year or two ago, so that if a student gets into a magnet school, they can stay in that school to the highest level of that program, such as Seven Oaks would be through fifth grade. Right. If the child did choose to go to their home school, they have a seat available to them because, of course, that's where they're counted. They can choose out. But if students decide to pursue another opportunity or return to their home school, those are always options that we allow. Good, because that was a question, you know, if you got in one track, and, you know, they could think they really are really going to love that and not. Well, absolutely. Um, and then, this is just curiosity. Of the three kinds, the criteria base, the school within a school, and the whole school, um, and I know this may just be an opinion, but I would value your opinion. Do you see that it, um, do you think one works better than the other, or it has to do with the population, and one works better with this population and another with depending on they they all serve their unique purpose and um, you know I believe that a couple of our programs it's 
to keep all our schools viable. Mm -hmm. And so certain programs attract different folks for different reasons. And so they all serve a purpose. So it's good for us to have the variety. Absolutely, to have that. And, th and that's the way it is across the country. Good. A variety of models. Thank you. Yes. If I may ask for a round of applause from Ms. Wheeler. It was a fantastic <laughs> job. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you, thank you. I know everyone's always surprised that I can keep it to five minutes, but <laughs> Dr. Hefner knows me well. I follow directions. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. Next up this evening, uh, we are offering an update to you all on our I-5 technology initiative. This report is being given by Jenny Garris, our coordinator of instructional technology on behalf <laughs> of Mr. Richardson, his technology chief, and also of instruction. But with Ms. Garris this evening perched up at the top are Teresa Richardson and Linda Bonvillain, two of our instructional specialists for technology. So we're glad that they're here to support this report being given this evening by Ms. Garris. Ms. Garris. Good evening. Thank you. Tonight I'll be giving you an update on the I-5 technology initiative in our high schools. First, a little history. In the 2011-2012 school year, Dr. Hefner presented his Vision 2015 plan, which included the expansion of technology across our district for our students to include one-to-one -one devices. From this, the I-5 technology initiative began. Several task forces were formed, devices were chosen, personnel was hired, and training began for technology staff and teachers. Deployment started with high school students in 2013 and continued into our middle and intermediate schools in the following years. Ongoing professional development was, and still is, provided through our LEAD D5 teacher-led PD model and by our dis digital integration specialists on the school level. Currently, our high school students are issued iPad minis and our middle and intermediate students are issued Chromebooks. But I-5 is not about the device. Teaching and learning can be transformed by using technology as a tool to engage students through collaboration, problem solving, and creatively de demonstrating their learning. The I-5 vision is focused on strengthening the curriculum and competencies at, for work, citizenship, lifelong learning that will prepare students beyond academic success. Students should be prepared to show what they know and demonstrate what they have learned as teachers actively provide experiences for them to be communicators, creators, critical thinkers, and collaborators both in and out of the classroom. The profile of the South Carolina graduate, which I'm sure you're familiar with, strongly supports and encourages technology and it aligns with our I-5 vision. Graduates of District 5 must be prepared and proficient in their technology skills and knowledge. The components on the previous slide directly connect with the world-class skills that you see here. These world-class skills were developed by educators and business leaders in South Carolina as valuable qualities that our graduates need to be college and career ready. So where are we now? In our high schools, iPad minis were distributed to teachers and students in 2013, which was four years ago. These devices are now too old to update their operating systems, which can affect apps, usage, and management of the devices. We are also now mandated by state law to conduct online testing. Currently, the iPad minis do not meet the specifications required for testing, so our high school students must test in computer labs, which can displace regularly dis scheduled classes and present challenges for instructional scheduling. We are also a Google Apps for Education district. Our teachers and students, as well as board members, have Google email addresses, Google calendars, and unlimited storage space in Google Drive. iPads were made by Apple, which is a competitor of Google, so that means that not all of our Google apps have full functionality on their iPads, which sometimes creates challenges for our students. The I-5 Measuring Success Committee met in January to consider and prioritize 10 different physical characteristics of a device. First, let me give you a little background about that committee. After the I-5 technology initiative was underway, a committee comprised of representatives from each high school, teachers, um, digital integration specialists, and administrators all formed this committee. The teachers represent all departments, including fine arts, K, world language, and all levels of technology proficiency. When we created this committee, we asked principals to select teachers that would be voices for all teachers, from the tech-savvy first adopters to the hesitant teachers that are uncomfortable with integrating technology in their classrooms. The Measuring Success Committee is now in their third year. As you can see on this slide, the top five physical characteristics that were chosen by the committee are listed there. 
of highest priority was management of the devices at all levels. Currently, our devices are managed by the technology department so that only vetted apps are allowed and devices are connected to our filtered network. Teachers also would like to manage the devices in the classroom in order to increase and sustain student engagement during class. And I'll talk more about this in just a minute. In January, all high school teachers were asked to respond to a survey on the use and need of student mobile devices. The top four physical characteristics are listed here, and they were consistent among all users. So you can look and see we have battery life, mobility, camera, and an attached keyboard, and that was consistent among top users, which are the teachers that reported using devices daily, or almost daily, and all responses. Now, usage in the classroom can be different based on subject area. For example, a, a PE teacher will use technology on occasion, but less frequently than maybe an English teacher. With this in mind, we did ask teachers also what was the most important instructional uses that they had for using devices in their classroom. The list you see here are the items teachers indicated were very important for student devices in order to reach the learning goals that they are setting for their students. Researching, submitting assignments, creating and editing documents and presentations, as well as watching educational videos. One way videos can enhance learning is using a flipped classroom model. So students can watch a video from home the day before, and then they can come to school, and the video might be one that they found online, or sometimes teachers are creating their own videos as well to teach the content. Then class time is used for discussion and activities related to the information in the video. This maximizes time, but it's also dependent on the student being able to watch the video outside of class. So where are we going now? Based on the input from our committee and from the teacher survey, we need to match the new devices with these priorities and the needs, while also considering the cost of replacement, repair, and refreshment. By replacing a portion of the devices each year, we can avoid large purchases every four years and instead continually update the model of the devices to keep them current and operable. Also, providing a consistent Google platform will allow us to maximize a management system that teachers can use in their classrooms to focus and monitor the activity of students. Later this month, we are piloting a system like this at Crossroads Intermediate School, and we'll get feedback from the teachers to see if it allows them to utilize the one-to-one -one devices more effectively and increase engagement and productivity of the students in class. Based on these recommendations, the district will need to provide the most feasible, cost-effective device to meet our needs and priorities, both instructionally, financially, and logistically. To quote Dr. Hefner in his Vision 2020 presentation, the district's skill in dealing with its ever-changing variables is a major reason for the district's sustained high-level success. Technology is continually changing in education, just like in the real world. However, the purpose of our I-5 technology initiative has not changed. To prepare our students to be college and career ready in the 21st century and beyond, to be effective communicators, collaborators, critical thinkers, and creators. Thank you. Dr. Heffern, that completes that report, but if there's any questions, Mr. Richardson or I or Ms. Garris could answer any questions that the board members may have for this evening. Yeah, I saw Ms. Hammond had a question. I think Mr. Cates and Ms. Hutchison. So. If, if, I, <clears throat> if I am correct, is that still on? I think it's on, yeah. Um, we do have the Google Classroom capability now. The, the right. teacher can be in the classroom and see what the kids are on with their iPad. We have that now, or that's what you need. Um, Google Classroom actually is a way that teachers would deliver content to students and students would turn it in, but they can't see what's on the student devices okay. through Google Classroom. Well, where? I can tell you we have that where I teach, and it's, it's very effective, especially with eighth graders. I know y'all won't believe this, but kids go to the sites they're not supposed to do sometimes. <laughs> um, and, but we're able to block them. We're able to, I can be in my classroom and I have my, my iPad, they have theirs, and I've invited them into my class. And it really works well. And I was assuming, I, I couldn't tell from the presentation whether we are working toward that so the t teacher can have that management. We, ha we have Google Classroom for the content. And, they and send then, the yeah, we're going to pilot Hapara which maybe you. is what you're using, I'm not sure. but I, that's, I don't know the name, the I just tool. know how it works. But I'm just, I would like to say that's, that's really effective if a teacher is going to use that as a tool in the classroom. Yeah, I mean, Great. you've got to be able to monitor the student. Otherwise, they're playing a game on there. And you can't look at, 
25 students at the same time unless you have that technology. So I, I, I would certainly support us being able to get that. Um, the other thing is, um, will it be, Dr. Melton, are we going to be okay with the State Department about that we've got to use computer labs because they are saying we are testing because, see, we're going to use our iPads because each student can do that. But we're going to have to go in all our schools to a computer lab in order to meet that requirement by the State Department? We are pulling all resources together. Mr. Richardson, Ms. Garris, uh, Mr. Sullivan, and all of our technicians have been trying to collect information as to where needs are. We know that we have maybe a computer lab with one or two desktops that are not oper operational at this point, so we're trying to work on those. And we're also looking to see what devices may be on carts, may be in media centers that haven't been checked out that we could pull into the circulation. We did, as a system, request the department to give us a waiver for this yes. testing season because we had the um, concern that perhaps we didn't have the resources nor the infrastructure to test successfully with all tests that we were expected to do this year. So we are doing some online, but we are also doing some paper and pencil for the testing assessments of 2017. Of course, by law, we are supposed to be doing it this year, but we do have an extension to be oh, prepared okay. for next year. That's where I was worried for you. And mm -hmm. the other thing I would say, and I know your staff knows this, it's so important that kids have practiced taking a test Absolutely. online. It's very different than paper and pen. Mm -hmm. Some like it better, some are more apprehensive, even though they're technologically savvy, they don't, you know, they, they get more nervous and, and our schools are graded by their past tests. So I would just say, I, I thank you. I mean, I wasn't worried that you're not doing whatever you need to be doing, but I just wanted to clarify when you said in the presentation about the, um, you know, that we have to meet that standard. It was part of the, um, you know, the State Department's directive. They right. have to be online. So well, I can give you one example. Just last week, um, we had a meeting with our assistant principal's instruction at the high schools in addition to the center. And we know, and I'll use Chapin High School as an example, we have not enough um, devices to test successfully with biology. So some of the students are looking perhaps to test at the center because they spend part of their day there, um, depending on whether it's A day or B day. So we're looking to see what resources we might have, but we want to make sure that whatever testing situation we have is most successful for students. So will students be comfortable testing at the center when that's not necessarily their home school? So that's some of the conversations that we're currently having, actually counting each device and then how many students are going to need a device to take the test because they are required to do it during the testing season that's coming up. My last one, Dr. Melton, mm -hmm. would we, um, you know how you have to have the monitors and it's so strict about past testing mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, any type of breach of security. <coughs> Will, do you foresee the testing having still to have that number of people at work to monitor a classroom like we've had to do for years? Or will um, this change? Do you think that will be able to be changed, that you won't need that much staff to do that? I think it's going to depend on what staff you have available. If you were to have this auditorium full of teachers, they probably would tell you they like monitors just in case one needs to run to the restroom, just in case the <coughs> teacher needs to step out. So we try to listen to what the requests are of our testing coordinators and from our principals to make sure that we have ample staff to make those um, coverages whenever they're needed. But I can't say to you we have a quota of how many people per school that we're going to need to have as testing monitors. Now, what is online testing going to do for us, especially when we start reaching down to third grade? We're not quite sure at this point. Uh, we do expect some students to have um, a reaction because they are accustomed to taking computerized tests such as MAP testing throughout the school year. But a state summative test brings, as you know, a little more pressure on the teacher, but especially on the child as well. So we have a delay this year when it comes to our elementary grades, but um, our middle schoolers have responded favorably and our high schoolers do very well. Good. Well, wish you luck. I mean, it's great, but there's also that learning curve. Absolutely. And I, I'm thinking of students and teachers and the apprehension to it. So. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Cates, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to serve on a district committee for technology and a state education oversight uh, committee subcommittee. And the question and concern was raised at that time that testing on any student controlled device mm -hmm. could be a problem. Mm -hmm. Now I know we're looking potentially at device replacement, but will that address that particular concern that you may not be able to test on a device that's been under the control of the student and not exclusively under the control of the district? Mm -hmm. Well, our Chromebooks in our middle school, the district-owned Chromebooks, they have an app 
for the test that is pushed out to those Chromebooks. And when the student opens that, it's a separate secure browser. So that takes care of that problem right there. Um, iPads or iPad minis that we have in the high school, the issue we have there is one, the screen size doesn't meet the specs. But the other part is not all testing companies will make the apps that are for iPad with a secure browser. That's a little more of a challenge. So we see that as a, a little more challenging than it is with Chromebooks. And then my second question, we've uh, piloted and implemented technology now for a number of years. Um, have we collected data that can show is this truly uh, improving instruction uh, and enhancing learning in the seat? So are we getting to the place where we can uh, demonstrate uh, the benefit of that one-to-one -one, uh, technology? Let's explain the process first. If you've noticed the report that Mrs. Garris gave, the committee that she described to us is called Measuring Success. We thought it was important to look at things from a positive, proactive lens. It's very difficult to tease out what is the effect of technology versus what is the effect without technology. And we don't want to have control groups of this student gets it, this student does not. Let's compare the results if they have the same teacher. So there have been a lot of variables that come into place. We felt it was most um, successful for us to gauge first the wave of supportive teachers and the response of teachers. So the population on the committee that Mrs. Garris described to you, we intentionally made sure that we recruited and invited teachers of different levels of proficiency and exposure to technology were a voice on this committee. So it's not just our digital integration specialists, of course, who are the most savvy to come in and help us drive these decisions and help us make the long-term commitments to what to do next as far as the vision of, of Dr. Hefner's for technology and integration. So the first skills that we were looking for were just the basic um, behavioral kinds of things, uploading information, downloading information, online collaboration, those um, what's probably considered now out-of-date behaviors of students. So now we're asking this committee to look forward with us and what might be next. So Mrs. Garris and Mr. Richardson and I have reached out to a company, company that's coming in during the month of April. Mm -hmm. um, I forget when things are happening sometimes. They're going to be sending a representative in to help us look what have we accomplished thus far and what do you recommend is next. Dr. Hefner, of course, will be instrumental with this because he will be able to personally share his vision um, about District 5 as far as our technology integration, which, which will, of course, be about the resources, the infrastructure, but also what we want to see happen at the user level with our students, but also with our teachers. So that gives you kind of an overview, but I want to pause if there's something else Mrs. Garris would like to add because she's been the one that's been spearheading all these committees and working directly with our specialists at the school level. So Mrs. Garris. Um, I would agree exactly with what you said about the measurement. You know, there's, there's to, to tease that out because there are so many other factors and student achievement is difficult. But we, we really rely a lot on our teachers and their feedback and we provide our professional development, which has been extremely well attended and asked for and, and they want more and more. So we know that by our principals observing in the classrooms and what they see and seeing the student engagement, what level of activities they're seeing with the technology in the classroom, whether it's just you know replacing paper, which is a simple substitution, and that's not bad. At the same time, are they also <coughs> engaging them in activities that are at a higher level that the technology enables them to do that they wouldn't normally be able to do just with a whiteboard, for example. So we have to take all those factors into consideration. We look at how do we define success, which is really what this committee has talked about. Um, and so overall, I, I, my answer to you would be yes, but to put that in a number I think would be a, a difficult to quantify. Um, I'm looking forward to our future ready consultant that's coming in April, and so we'll start looking at where, where we've been, where we are now, and then setting some vision as we go forward. I think we could offer personal stories that when the the wireless did go down in January, the number of phone calls we had, we need this back up, my child can't access this or that. They are using this as a tool and both parents and students see the value and definitely have the evidence to show that they're taking notes for exam preparation and just the day-to-day -day instructional delivery. Thank you, Mrs. Garris. We appreciate Thank your report you. this evening. Uh, we had one more question, oh, okay. at least one more, I'm sure, Ms. Hutchinson. <laughs> um, thanks. I wanted to ask about the, uh, is it the middle schools that use this Google or middle and high? Well, we use Google as a the whole district because oh, we have okay. Google email and, and everything, but the, the middle schools have Chromebooks, so that may be what you're referring to. Okay. Yeah. So does that mean that all the students have a Gmail account? They do. Yes, ma'am. I had, um, and I don't know, I, I'd like to know how you monitor that. I did have a, a concerned middle school parent who 
felt that there might be some problems with um, the parent not having any access to the to the Gmail account just to make sure you know things are going right and the Gmail is used properly um, and concern that students have a little bit too much freedom especially at the younger ages with the Gmail account and they can't be monitored by the parent they can be monitored by the parent, okay. absolutely. Um, we give them a default password to begin with, which is a very simple password, but then we show kids how they can change their password. And we try to send, and our principals do a great job with this, our di digital integration specialists, um, sending out information to parents on digital citizenship. We teach that to our students. We teach, try to get that information to our parents as well. And when we teach kids about strong passwords, which plays right into having an email and being responsible, we talk to them about you shouldn't give your password to anyone except your parents. And a parent at any time, they could call the school and they could read it. If, if the child, for example, would say, I'm not giving you my password, the parent, all they need to do is call the school. They can talk to the principal or an administrator. And we would be able to get in touch with that parent, reset that password to something that they know. That would never be a problem. Okay, I yeah, will pass absolutely. that Absolutely, But we do try to teach them digital citizenship and, and using the tools appropriately. That's part of our curriculum. Right, well that's good. Yeah. But sometimes there'll be kids, right? Be yeah, kids. and our students will tell on one another. When someone does something inappropriate, we, we hear about it. And so our, our administrators, again, do a fabulous job in reinforcing that and, and working with our kids. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Ms. Bumgarner. Oh, Ms. Garris, I appreciate your uh, comments. Um, what I'd like to know, do you offer, is there any plans to offer like a community base te to teach grandparents and, and uh, computer illiterate people some more uh, <laughs> literacy in technology? You know, like through the center or something like that because I know I would certainly be interested in, in that. But, you know, and a lot of times with cyberbullying and things like that so that parents <clears throat> can know how to monitor better. We have done some of those in the past. We've had outreach and community um, classes. It's not something we have on the, mm. on the list right now, but it's certainly something we can consider. Um, a lot of our uh, digital integration specialists in our schools, if mm. you don't have children in the school, you can still contact yeah. the school. They have sat down with community members and parents to show them what we're doing, show them how to do things. Um, we'd be happy to help you, so anytime. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Hammond. In responding to Ms. Bumgarner, um, it's a good point to make, um, and I, I know you know this, I say this for people that don't, but one of the biggest things with middle school kids is they, it is the cyber, but you know, they, they just, they're mean girls, and they're sometimes mean guys, and they just say things, and they u misuse it. Um, but I, I wanted to say, you were right, where, where you have, uh, the staff just has to be very, you know, diligent with it. Um, the other thing that you might not even think about, one of the biggest problems I have, they, like, they can take pictures with it. So they like to take pictures of if you have something that you're presenting on the board, you can send it to them, but sometimes they just want to do a picture. But of course they like to take pictures of each other, and you know that's wrong, and they'll misuse that. So I just would say it is a lot of education to it for a parent that would not even think that their favorite thing to do on this iPad is take pictures of each other. But you know, these are eighth graders, like, like in Ms. Hutchins is right, kids are gonna do things, you just have to be vigilant. But as great as technology is, you know, it can go down. Uh, a teacher has got to have plan A and plan B, <laughs> and, and you have to be ready for kids, my, our principals check them, they'll walk into that room and take it up from that kid that's misused it and sent the wrong kind of picture. So it is a learning curve. Um, that Ms. Bumgarner is maybe, uh, you know, asking about. It is something that you would not think about, I don't think, if you grew up not having these, these, this uh, access to technology. You wouldn't even think about it. So um, it is a big learning curve. And, of course, I, I know our teachers know it, but I think it's a good point for parents to be aware of it. Ms. Garris, I, I hate to add one more thing, or uh, Dr. Melton, but I think I've heard from several board members the concern of parents maybe not knowing this piece about being able to get to a child's Chromebook or whatever. And, uh, and, and I heard you say, Ms. Garris, that at our schools there are, if the question comes, they'll get it. I don't, would you all just put in the back of your mind to maybe plan, maybe by cluster, to offer that? And it could be an offering, I mean, there's a thousand things around to do, but it might be really something that would be, uh, 
if we could put the information out around registration time, something like that, so parents would know they could get some help. I don't think some of them know where they could get it, and just like Ms. Bumgarner said, some updates for parents because students understand the devices a whole lot better than anybody older than the student, I can promise you that. And the younger the student, the more they understand, I think. So just, just a little food for thought if you'd put that in the back of your to-do think about list. Absolutely. And, and for you Thank all you. to know, we do orientations when the school year starts before devices are <clears> accepted <throat> by our students that we um, re require our parents to go through. So the orientation gives a broad overview. Mr. Cates right. is nodding his head. He sat through several of those, I'm sure. And then we also have a guide that has a lot of the frequently asked questions, but other information that parents are required that they have to read and then sign that they've accepted it. But the more we can do to make it personal, the better and more successful we're going to be. I do commend Mrs. Garris and our digital integration specialists and our schools because each school designs unique things based on the feedback they have from their parents and community members and we of course will continue to do that but we'll certainly look for ways that we can standardize some support to make sure those themes of messages that you all hear about get <coughs> out to parents and we right. can make sure that we support that messaging so that everyone is clear of what to do when you encounter a problem and where the resources are that parents can reach out to. And, and during that registration probably great if the student knew that the parent being available <laughs> they're, that they're a part of that, yeah. To just make sure they understand that their right. parent will know how to right. do this or that or correct, check behind, which will make Thank them all you. on the same. Absolutely. I, I just appreciate what you're doing. Obviously, I'm a technology user and an early adopter. So, um, and if some of it does come back to the parent education. I've always had access to my boys' social media accounts, their email, and I think some of that is a part of that awareness. And so I appreciate what you're doing because that impacts not only what's going on in the school, which is our primary importance, but that does have a big impact on what's going on uh, as they move out into the community when they're on these devices, maybe not school-issued devices, mm -hmm. but social media over the summer, uh, and anything we can do to minimize uh, some of that negative impact, uh, the cyberbullying. I appreciate uh, what you're doing and just... Uh, what we are doing as a district uh, to teach good digital citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank good. you, Ms. Garris. Thank you, Dr. Milton. We appreciate Thank you. the report. And our uh, third and final report this evening underneath the uh, superintendent's report uh, is that uh, I wish to give you an update on uh, Vision uh, 2020. Uh, as you re recall, uh, beginning in September 12th, 2012, uh, we worked on Vision 2015, and upon the completion of the things that were in that plan, I came back to you on uh, September 12th, uh, 2016, with Vision 2020. I won't go through the entire report, but as you will recall, we ended up, or I ended up making five specific recommendations, and I want to give you an update on where we are with those. So recommendation number one uh, was to add a third wing at uh, Chapin Middle School, and would let you know uh, again and let the public know where we are with that. Uh, with uh, that, uh, we um, selected an architect, as you will recall, on September 26th. Uh, the architectural contract was approved on February 13th. Uh, architectural plans were presented to the board at your last meeting, and we are currently negotiating a contract for contractual, contractual management at risk with a building contractor, and hopefully uh, that uh, will be completed and brought back to you at your next uh, meeting. And I'm happy to report that we are on schedule uh, for a completion date of June 2018 and opening the new wing to students in August of 2018. Uh, number two was that we build a new elementary school, which for right now I'm calling elementary number 13 in the Chapin cluster. Uh, subsequently, I uh, it recommended to you that the school be built on the Amex Ferry side of Chapin and the district has entered into option agreements for property on Amex Ferry Road, and currently due diligence is being conducted on this property uh, to determine if the site is suitable for an elementary uh, school. 
Number three was that uh, we establish a planning function or restore the planning function to our district office. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, that has not been addressed, but hopefully we'll have a plan for, for that uh, in the near future. Number four, as you heard the report this evening, continuing from Vision uh, 2015, to continue to expand magnet and choice options throughout the district to do the things that uh, Ms. Wheeler described, to make optimum use of our existing space, enhance the ability of each student uh, of each school to compete effectively with other schools in our district and community, and uh, lastly, to meet the unique educational needs of our students. As, as was indicated, we are working on our grant proposal, which would add some new, uh, provide funding for new uh, magnet programs here in our district, and we'll be keeping our fingers crossed for that. And number five uh, was to assess and prioritize the need and identify a plan to fund a multitude of projects. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but we'll place them back on the, the screen. And since September, I've been sharing this uh, the whole 2020 uh, at many, many different locations, with certainly with all my uh, advisory groups and with our um, uh, uh, SIC cluster groups and uh, sharing with them all of the things in this plan. And on number five, out, out of all of that, uh, two items have been requested that uh, be added to this list, uh, and those are these, that uh, there will be a creation uh, of additional athletic fields. This request comes from the Chapin cluster, feeling very strongly that they don't have enough athletic fields available to them for their uh, athletic events. And secondly, that we add lighting of uh, additional athletic fields, again, thinking that that would uh, expand the use of the fields we already have if they were uh, lit. So uh, th with, uh, with that, we will add those things as something to number five, items that need to be prioritized and assessed in terms of uh, where we would go with that in the future. As you will recall, or as you may recall, I concluded the 2020 presentation uh, going back to the two words that I use, we talk about our district, extraordinary and dynamic. And uh, my concern, that is, if we don't continue to move forward, we'll become just another ordinary district and uh, our communities will be dying. So we want to work hard to make sure we're staying current, doing the things we need to do to keep our school district uh, continue for it to be extraordinary and dynamic. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have on that. Ms. Hutchinson. Dr. Hutton, I wanted to ask you about that last um, item where you mentioned addition, oh, sorry, additional athletic fields and, um, yeah, thank you, and lighting, and that was for the Chapin area. I'm just curious, is that, was that generated by, um, say, one of the schools um, or other schools going to submit information, or is that... I, I took it as being, that their, their real focus was on the Chapin cluster, but when I shared it with Irmo, of course, Irmo said, yes, we need that too. So I, I, I think it is something we take a look at across our entire system, not just exclusively okay. for uh, one, one cluster or the other. It would be uh, looking at additional athletic fields and lighting uh, of the fields we already have all across the system. Um, and then... Uh, has there been a request for us to review the fine arts um, facilities in, in our different schools? Of course, I know Irmo has a beautiful fine arts, thankfully. Um, the only one that's on the list is for the Chapin cluster. I ha haven't had a specific request, right. but you certainly, you know, we can certainly add that uh, to the list. And you know, we are updating the one at uh, Dutch Fork High School very shortly. All right. Okay, that sounds good. And then for um, the magnet, you said you hope to increase the the choice in the magnet. How how are you determining which uh, what type of magnets? How is that determined? What is the process? All right, I may need some help from Dr. Uh, Milton. Of course, that's something we've been working on uh, for not just uh, months, but really for uh, several years, and it would be a combination of where we think we have a shot at securing money 
Uh, and again, our, our, right now, we don't ever want to put all of our eggs in one basket, but right now our, our hope is uh, for another grant from, uh, the, uh, from the federal government. And so we know what they're looking for, so we're trying to match our needs to that. But Dr. Milton uh, and uh, um, Ms. Wheeler can provide more information about that. We are looking at a variety of things from what um, careers are projected to be in the areas, obviously with STEM or STEAM, converting Leap Park from a STEM focus to a STEAM focus, bringing in more of that artistic expression and creative thinking. So we're looking ahead at some careers that are on the horizon, but we're also looking at creating some pathways that a student doesn't have to wait, and I'll use Nursery Road as an example that um, Ms. Wheeler spoke of earlier. A student shouldn't have to wait till they get to ninth grade to experience arts integration. So those that have the interest at the elementary level, and many of you have been to Nursery Road, it fits there. We know that we have the staff that already have those natural tendencies to integrate the arts, but we also know that we have some available seats there. So we're looking at a variety of factors of who has the seats available, and if you have the seats available, what kinds of things do you already have as a strength among your faculty, and how might that align with college and career readiness? Um, recently, I've attended a session that said we shouldn't say career readiness, we should say careers, because there's so many careers 85% of the careers are projected for our current kindergarten class have not been created yet. That is nearly astounding to think about that as a percentage. So what can we do to make sure that students are ready when they get to that decision-making point of what might be next for them? So we're looking at research and trends. We're looking at the strength of the faculty. We're looking at available seats. And then we're also looking to see, quite candidly, what is the federal government funding and how might that reach our needs? We know right now STEAM is very popular among the federal uh, funding. That's something that will benefit our program, but <coughs> also connect our elementary programming with what happens at Dutch Fork High School, of that school within a school, um, of STEM at Dutch Fork High School. So we're trying to make sure that we have some bridges. It's not just happening at the high school secondary level of exposure when it could happen much earlier and ignite a child's passion um, when they're very impressionable. Is there anything you'd like to add? Now, one thing that is really great is that we have a lot of collaboration with our high school students, even working with elementary students and middle school students. So that's been a, a big plus. Thank you. Ms. Hammond. I, I, I may have written this down wrong, but you had the elementary school that you, if you go back, the one that we you made it number 13. And then I, and then that's the Chapin cluster. And then there was another one that'll be developed. This is later because I mean I, I wrote down thirteen, but it, maybe it should have been fourteen. No, go forward. Go forward. It's, yeah, go all the way. No, it was on the bullet point list of other. In other words, my question was: I know Very we need that. There. I know we need one. The one we're looking at, where you talked about. Well, what I what I uh, have indicated. What I. Uh, uh, think is needed is uh, we'll eventually need two elementary okay, schools. That was so that so Chapin. I did it right. It was thirteen, and then number fourteen is one in the future. That's correct. Okay, that, that's what I thought. Um, and the um, just for I think for constituents, use use the word due diligence that that you're looking at. Um, you may want to say what that is. Is it like? How do we, how do we? Due diligence includes such things as, and uh, I probably cannot give you an all-inclusive list, but certainly a title search, a boundary survey, geotechnical studies, uh, environmental studies, uh, uh, assessing uh, the uh, 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 road frontage, uh, and uh, getting approvals from the Department of Transportation yes. and from the Office of School Facilities, and there's probably another several other key points that uh, didn't come to my mind right this very second. Thank you. That's all. I just wanted specifics so that they would know what we, what's in the background of, as you look at somewhere. Other questions? All right. Thank you. That concludes the superintendent's report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Hefner. Those were great reports all the way around. Thank all of those who participated. Uh, that brings us to item number 12, which is public participation.